I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 1st, 2016. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Eleanor Crowell, member of the Special Education Citizens <coughs> Advisory Committee. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item of business is consideration of the agenda for the meeting. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's uh, agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Our next item is a selection of speakers. <coughs> Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first is Sarah Rosen. Number two is Marion Moore. Number three is Deborah Thompson. Number four is Karen Wilson. Five is Russell Kuhn. Six is Jacob Dunyali. Number seven is Yara Sheik. Number eight is Deborah Thompson, but we already had Deborah Thompson. Number eight is Teresa Johnson. Number nine is Russell Kuhn, but we already had Russell Kuhn. Number nine is Teresa Johnson, but we already had Teresa Johnson. Wow. Number nine is Beverly Grace. And number 10 is Danielle Zagari Mask. Thank you. And uh, again, I would ask in fairness to all those who travel here to speak, uh, we do ask that you only submit your name once in the box. Um, I guess we have uh, eliminated those that we pulled twice in the past, but uh, uh, again, I would just ask in fairness to all those who would like to speak that you only put your name in the box one time. Thank you. Um, our next item then will be our superintendent's report, and I'll turn that over to Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Just a couple of quick announcements. I know we've been hearing from a lot of parents on our school calendar because we've missed eight inclement weather days so far and we only had seven days built in. Um, however, our calendar has more instructional days than is needed and is required uh, by, by state law. So therefore, at this point, we don't believe there are any adjustments that we need to make to our school calendar. I am in constant communication with the interim state superintendent about possibly seeking a waiver for the state of emergency days along with other colleagues um, in the state of Maryland. We've now begun our community meetings um, for our high school renovation projects. We're very grateful uh, to the county for um, its move to move forward with our high school renovation projects as we look at our elementary projects as well. Um, I do want to say a special uh, um, apology to the Delaney High School community and the Patapsco High School community. Uh, last week, uh, we wanted to make sure that in, in looking at transparency that we posted our feasibility studies um, for our four high school projects. When we realized there were several errors in a couple of the reports, we took them all down immediately 
Healy, went through them again working with Rubling and Associates, and now they're back online. This does not change the scope of work or the projected con on construction costs for any of the projects. However, we want to make sure the documents are accurate, of course, being online. We've already held our community meeting at Lansdowne and got some great feedback. We've also held our community meeting at Patapsco High School. Tomorrow night we'll be at Whitlawn High School and we'll be with the Delaney community on Thursday. So we look forward to sharing the scope of work um, with each of those communities, but also uh, beginning the next phase of the process, which is the design and then ultimately the construction phase. All four high school projects are projected to end in August of 2019 with renovated uh, buildings. We still have some more time left for the stakeholder satisfaction survey. We have almost 70,000 responses right now. Remember, community members, parents, teachers, students um, can take the survey. They also can take it more than once um, if they're in different fields um, or in different categories. So we look forward to um, looking at and tabulating the survey responses to inform much of the work that we have going forward. And last but not least, I'll be sharing this with our principals next week, um, but really just want to say a special thank you uh, to all of our principals. Even though we report the graduation rate at the high school level, there's a lot of work that occurs at the elementary and the middle school level to prepare students for high school. But most recently, the state of Maryland just posted that we have nearly an 88% graduation rate. Technically, it's 87.8% graduation rate. And while that's a very, very good statistic for a large school system, what we're really excited about is if you look at our African American and our white students, there is statistically no achievement gap when it comes to our graduation rate in Baltimore County. So our star video tonight is really highlighting some of the work that we've done to increase our graduation rate over the last five years. We really have been collaborative in this process and extremely intentional in terms of how we were to attack the graduation rate and the dropout um, dilemma that we had. And what we found was that in order for this to work, we had to centralize a process. We had to put a process in place that would work for all 28 of our high schools that we have here, including our alternative schools. But in order to do that, we had to have our principals on board, assistant principals, our PPWs, uh, we had to also work with our staff because the goal was that every school needed to have a team of individuals who were going to do dropout prevention on their campuses. Went right to work in putting together a graduation committee um, and taking some strategic actions in terms of really personalizing the environment. One of the things we have done is we've intervened early and often with kids. So identifying those kids who would need the additional support uh, and then connecting them to that support and then really monitoring that support. They probably saved me. It, if, I, if they didn't do anything, I probably would have been doing the same thing, and my mom wouldn't have done anything, so I wouldn't have been any further than I was now, so. To me, Oberly High School means everything. It's surprising because everyone thinks that Oberly is a bad school, because we always get like negative comments about it, but really it's not. Like, if you really think about it, the teachers are very helpful, and the counselors. Like they'll do their best to help you succeed. It's amazing. It's more of a community. The kids have a different attitude coming in and they have a different mindset. So they're focused. They want to learn. They want to keep our school nice. And they actually get angered when they go out into the community and someone says disrespectful things about Overly or I had to go to Overly. And now students want to come and they want to make it better. So realistically, that's I think the biggest thing we've done is to personalize the environment, change the culture, that kids understand the importance of having a diploma and the opportunities that it opens beyond the four walls that are overly high school and then checking in with the kids frequently um, and really personalizing the environment so they feel connected to the school and they feel connected to the staff. I chose to wear overly colors today because I am pr proud of the school. My ninth grade year, um, beginning of high school, I lost my father so I wasn't very sociable. I stayed to myself. Um, I walked around there, had a very attitude problem, didn't even want to talk to me. And the problem that I had was um, I didn't see what they saw in me at first and now I'm getting to see that and I'm becoming a better person. And you know, just the uh, camaraderie, the teamwork, and we've seen the, the growth of the staff and just how everybody really cares for their students. Many of these kids are kids who tend to have a tremendous amount of adversity. They come to school with a lot of baggage. We, as a school system, have not really done a phenomenal job around really determining what the root causes are. And one of the things that I said to my schools was that I'm very accustomed to mentoring. I know that that was something that helped me. There were people who came into my life and being a, a kid who was in an at-risk situation, had it not been for random adults coming into my life and helping me, there's no way 
I'm sitting here moving on to become a superintendent of an urban school system. This year we've taken uh, to meeting as a team weekly and using that time to really monitor uh, every student in each graduation cohort and make sure that they're making the progress they need to towards graduation and when we find that they may not be reaching out to the parents and reaching out to our faculty. Our faculty uh, certainly serve as formal mentors through our senior mentorship program and really have um, improved our graduation rate by building uh, incredibly strong relationships with many of our students. I love them, they're like my family. It's like they help me 24 seven. They're always there for me and they're never not gonna be there. I know what it's like to fail and I hated failing and I wanna be motivated in high school. So I wanna keep going. I don't wanna fail ever again. <laughs> I mean, we really are in the kid's face and we're there with love, but sometimes it's some pretty tough love as far as, you know, I say to the kids all the time, we love you, we do not want you here next year. It is time for you to move on with your life. <laughs> love ya, get your diploma. You see it in their faces, like, I, I take band this year, so like I see it in my band teacher's face, like, yes, you got something, like, it's like this proud moment when the teacher says you've got something and then you feel proud about it. So we're so very proud of our kids and the 80 um, 8% graduation rate is for the class of 2015. We really <laughs> have to remind um, our seniors now that we, we have less than three months to go um, until the class of 2016 graduates. We chose to highlight um, Overly High School as the main high school in that video because over the last uh, four years, Overly High School has increased its graduation rate by our 12%. And so Dr. Dorothy's done a great job. followed Penny Parker, who was the previous principal right before him. So extremely proud um, of our principals, Mr. Chair, members of the board. We look forward to the class of 2016 going even higher. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, our next agenda item is the chair's report. I just have a, some brief comments for tonight. We are in the midst of an important time in education uh, as the legislature is in session in Maryland. There are over 300 bills being considered in Annapolis that could potentially impact education in the state. The Maryland Association of Boards of Education, MABE, is highlighting legislation that fully funds pre-K and another introduced to create the Commission on Innovative and Excellence in Education. At the same time, local boards and school systems are following items that will impact their specific area. Um, I would also like to acknowledge at this time those from the southwest area of the county that participated in the redistricting hearing on February 17th and those that provided additional comments through letter and email. Clearly there are many passionate, involved, and knowledgeable parents and community members in this area. This, kind of, this is the kind of energy uh, that allows Baltimore County schools to continually improve and provide an enhanced education for our students. I would uh, also express the board's appreciation to those who were members of the redistricting committee that put many hours of study and deliberation resulting in the recommendation that's being presented this evening. I would like to recognize my fellow board member, Mr. Nick Stewart, a resident of the Southwest area who invested considerable time understanding the nuances of the area, as well as other board members who attended some of the redistricting meetings as well as other community meetings. Uh, Dr. Russell Brown and his staff at BCPS should be commended as they provided considerable data to the board to aid in our decision-making process. I really wish that there were uh, a solution at hand that would address all the student and community needs, but that's just not reality. Uh, finally, I would like to mention that this is Read Across America Week. There are activities scheduled this week in various schools that involve parents and community members to encourage reading. I was able to make it out to visit Winfield Elementary School and Randallstown Elementary School this week. I wanted to send, send, send a shout out to all the wonderful students and teachers that I met during my visits. So that's all I have for tonight. And uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to our student member, Ms. Walia. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. It's good evening, Team BCPS. As Dr. Dan said, we're already more than halfway through the school year. The year's winding down, and I know as students, we're all feeling overwhelmed, exhausted, and senioritis is real. 
<laughs> Trust me, I know that feeling. <laughs> However, this is not the time to give up. This is the time to keep pushing and finish off strong. We're almost there. It is the home stretch. I'm in the process of visiting schools around the county to be able to provide an informed student opinion. I was able to visit elementary schools from all over the region, all over the county. During these school visits, I was able to sit down and talk to students during lunch as well as visit classrooms. It was great to see our first, second, and third graders so excited about their devices. Watching them work on their devices and talk about how school has become more enjoyable with their devices was a great feeling. Students who were also very honest about some of the concerns they had. I was able to take those concerns directly to Ms. White and her staff to make sure those concerns get addressed. I'm very appreciative for the students being completely honest with me because that helps me being able to properly represent <coughs> them. I'm now starting my middle school visits and then high school. I will be visiting a lot of schools in the next few months. As the end of my term approaches, we're in the process of selecting the next student member of the Board of Education. I would like to take a minute to thank all students who applied to be the next student member. For the first time ever, we'll be holding a SMOB forum on March 18th at Lock Raven High School. At the forum, the finalists will do speeches and conduct a Q&A with the students from around the county. The students in the audience will then vote to select the student that will be nominated to the governor for approval. <coughs> so you, and it is open for everyone to come and join us that day. Again, I'm your vote is for students, so please feel free to email me and your <coughs> thoughts and concerns. Thank you, and that concludes my SMOB report. Thank you, Ms. Walia. <coughs> Our uh, next item is uh, public comment. Um, our public, yeah. <clears throat> this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested <laughs> citizens and will take your comments into consideration. Even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public comment on policy, programs, and practices within the pur purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask that you observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. At this time, we'd like to hear from our advisory and stakeholder groups, and we'll begin by hearing from uh, Ms. Abby Baton from TAPCO. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, with two S's, I got it right, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. I have just come from a weekend conference with several hundred National Education Association members. And by the way, the National Education Association is the group that brought you Read Across America, and I used to serve on the National Committee to do that, so I'm very familiar with it. Not only had many of my board members traveled with me, but we were, we were uh, with other educators from Maryland as well as folks from all over the United States and even from other countries, they were in attendance there as well. I sat at a table in one of the sessions with some educators from Great Britain. Needless to say, it was always enlightening to talk with fellow educators, but it is also in disheartening to hear so many say how we are being forced to teach in ways that are not in our students' best interests. I hear from kindergarten teachers that feel their students are not being educated in, in an appropriate manner. They don't have enough recess or play or many of the opportunities that are essential for the development of the whole child. I hear from teachers who talk about the lack of time to help their students develop a love of learning because they are preparing for the next test or have to follow a mandated schedule. Instead of taking their cues from the students, they are forced to follow the timeline. But I also heard hope. The hope from these educators that the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or what is now known as Every Student Succeeds Act, will be begin to undo some of the harmful decisions that have been foisted upon our schools. 
we are lucky here in Baltimore County because we are collaborative and work on a, I work on a teacher evaluation steering committee that has already begun to contemplate changes that will help alleviate some of these issues. We have a long way to go, but the money that should now become available through the reauthorization should help us as we move forward. We know we have to forge some new ground, but our children are worth it. They are more than a test score or widgets to be measured over and over to make sure they measure up. <coughs> children should not be measured, they should be treasured and nurtured and given the tools to live happy, productive lives. It's up to all of us to make sure that happens and that we never again test and punish. We need to take the time to learn and the time to teach. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, Lee Crowell. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Members of the board, Dr. Dance. Uh, my name is Lee Kroll, and I'm the mom of an awesome second grader named Matt, who is on the autism spectrum. I'm also the special education liaison for Franklin Elementary School's PTA, and tonight I'm representing the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. I'd like to address, address an important issue, uh, one that I had the privilege of discussing with Dr. Dance and the CCAC a few months ago. Additional assistance, specifically what they do versus what we give them. Uh, if you need to know what these folks, who these folks are and what they do, please see the handout that I gave you. Look at the left hand side, please. Um, to sum up, additional assistants provide educational, social, emotional and physical support every day to our most vulnerable and high need students. My son has an additional assistant who is incredible. She is worth her weight in gold. Uh, she does everything on this handout and more and she does it for one, more than one child. Uh, Without her, my son would not have access to a free and appropriate public education. I've talked with many parents who have the same experience, who talk about how much of a game changer their child's additional assistant is. We're lucky because those of us who have great assistants working with our kids, and it's really just that luck, because it's pure luck that these folks are willing to stick around and do such an important and frankly exhausting job for less than you can make delivering pizzas. No benefits, no professional development, no contract. So here's the good news. That night at CCAC, we heard from Dr. Dance and others that there may be plans afoot to address the discrepancy between what additional assistants do and what we do for them. I'm asking you, the board, to be aware that this discrepancy exists, to support and encourage any plans for additional assistant training and compensation. And during this time of tight budgets and increasing needs, Please realize that this is an extreme need. There is no fat to cut here. If, actually hopefully when, you see budget items come across your desk having to do with additional assistance, please remember everything we expect, actually everything we need additional assistance to do versus what they earn versus what we give them. We all collectively need to look at the big picture of how we compensate these folks. Uh, how, and how we are approaching the recruitment, training, and retention of these really vital professionals. Because these folks are professionals, we're asking them to fulfill an important professional role. What we offer them should mirror our expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Marilyn Ryan. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Marilyn Ryan, member of the Board of Directors of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. And I'm here tonight to present comments from our president, Emery, who could not be here with us this evening. At our February board meeting, TABCO presented information to us on the National Education Association's Time to Learn initiative to cut back on the overuse of standardized testing. PTA Council Board of Directors adopted a motion to support TABCO's project to host house parties to educate parents, 
the community and PTA members on this matter. We informed the PTA officers of this initiative in a recent e-blast. We also informed PTA officers of another motion passed by the PTA Council Board of Directors. It was decided at our February board meeting to fund scholarships for graduating BCPS seniors. We decided as a team that this was a good use for PTA Council funds. We look forward to continuing this offer in the coming years. There are also scholarships available for graduating seniors from the Maryland State PTA. At our board meeting, a number of other issues were discussed, including the many safety concerns facing BCPS schools, students, and teachers. The bus driver shortage has resulted in students standing for long periods of time at bus stops and arriving to school getting there late. How much instructional time is being lost due to this? Students often sit four to a seat on a bus, and we've heard complaints from parents that some students are even sitting on the, in the aisles of the buses. We sincerely hope that this safety issue is now being addressed. PTA Council is also aware of the terrible conditions at the number of its schools, including Lansdowne High School, Delaney High School, and Dundalk Elementary School. Parents, teachers, and community members have banded together to fight for new schools in these areas. We hope that BCPS and the Board of Education are taking these citizens' pleas for help to heart. All students deserve a safe learning environment. Finally, we're concerned, having listened to TABCO stakeholder testimony and parent testimony at recent Board of Education meetings about the physical safety of teachers and students in our schools. When a top concern of our teachers union is teacher assaults, something clearly needs to be done. Parents have spoken passionately at recent Board of Education meetings about the state of chaos in some of our schools and how to help something needs to be done and done quickly. Learning cannot take place in an unsafe environment. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from our Citizens Advisory <coughs> Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Ms. Julie Miller-Breitz. Good evening, President McDaniels, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. A bit belatedly, but recognition for Gifted and Talented Month is due. February is the month set aside to recognize and celebrate excellence in gifted and talented education across the state of Maryland. To that end, the Maryland State Advisory Council for Gifted and Talented Education had their awards night on February the 24th. The GTCAC was thrilled that one of our own, Joyce D. Rienzi, was honored at that ceremony for her excellence as a parent and volunteer in Baltimore. Joyce has been an active volunteer for three decades in the field of education, and she has maintained this advocacy long past when her own children could benefit from it. We are thrilled with the just recognition she has received. Recognition should not end with Joyce, however. You may not realize it, but there are currently five BCPS employees who work their hearts out every day to service, to provide service to the 24,000 GT students out of 110,000 plus, and the 88,900 teachers that teach them here in the county. Uh, Wade Kearns, the new coordinator of advanced academics, has approached his position with energy and enthusiasm. He works very closely with the GTCAC and is providing outreach to the community as evidenced by his February 22nd presentation on advanced academics at the Northeast Advisory Council meeting where he positively impressed everyone as he spoke and answered parent questions for over an hour. Wade works with four other phenomenal employees, Donna Gottwin, Robin Holly Briante, Wendy Ingalls, and Deborah Myers, who answer the calls and questions of parents, teachers, and schools every day while also working closely with the curriculum department and staying current with best practices in the GT field and still finding time to provide PD, present regularly at conferences, and fine-tune their webpage. They are fantastic. 
Gifted and talented education also received a lot of press during the month of February. Liz Bowie, education writer for the Baltimore Sun with her February 13th article, Teaching of Gifted Children Changes Course in Baltimore County, wrote about the change to advanced academics and the hope that it will provide more equitable opportunities and flexible access among students to advanced curriculum, but also the concern among parents that it may not be giving students what they need and deserve to flourish. Worries exist that many teachers have not been trained in how to evaluate giftedness or how to teach GT students and who are still also adjusting their teaching strategies to new heterogeneous classroom groupings, problems that are maximized with the large class sizes that exist through much of the county. These same concerns were echoed in Nancy Grasmick's op-ed piece in the Baltimore Sun, High Academic Achievers Need Attention Too, when she compares the exceptional skills teacher in teachers in public schools have in teaching students who excel in their artistic talents, but when, when it comes to teaching academically talented students. To quote, People are often surprised to learn that we have a dropout issue, not only with underachieving students, but also with academically talented students. These students become bored and do not see the relevance of doing more of the same work that they have already mastered. They are capable of working at a faster pace than their peers or than a traditional classroom setting can provide. Further, these children often have needs beyond their academic issues that must be addressed as well. Their behavior can be different and misunderstood. Our nation is in a race to be the most competitive internationally. The issues of leadership and talent are critical to keeping our nation competitive. We must identify and acknowledge our gifted and highly talented students, provide them an individualized curriculum with interest-based learning experiences, provide highly qualified, knowledgeable teachers, and challenge their creativity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is public comment, and our first speaker will be Ms. Sarah Rosen. I appreciate being given this opportunity to speak. Thank you. I've heard that if you repeat something three times, people are more likely to remember it. Tonight, I will be repeating this message three times. More educators, less computers. In Baltimore County Public Schools, there are 33,000 students currently without air conditioning. 47% of our children are on free and reduced meals. There are schools with foundations sinking into a pond and schools with brown drinking water and bursting pipes. Every week, people complain about their children in elementary and middle schools being left on corners or at schools because there are not enough bus drivers. STAT is expensive. It costs Baltimore County Public Schools $58 million every single year just for the tablets. That is the equivalent to 1,000 teacher salaries. As we all know, technology teachers have been removed from schools, and these teachers taught students. Now STAT teachers have taken their place and STAT teachers teach teachers. Therefore, we have already lost teachers for our children to pay for this initiative. I am here tonight to advocate for more educators and less computers. Children do not need their own computers they can share. In addition to that, my first grader in a Baltimore County public school came home last Monday and said to me, Mommy, I don't want to see any more TVs or computers for the rest of the day. Let's just say that my daughter rarely complains about too much screen time in her own words. It turns out that she had had a new substitute that day, and even though the substitute plans only called for 45 minutes of computer time, I do not know how much time she actually spent on her computer that day. I am guessing it was a lot more than 45 minutes, given my six-year-old child's response. There were at least two groups of stakeholders who met on Saturday night in one neighborhood about dissatisfaction in Baltimore County public schools, specifically the elementary schools. Parents are concerned about priorities and are even considering alternatives to the elementary schools in Baltimore County public schools. I understand that at least two schools, one elementary and one middle, have allowed their, either their PTA or individual parents to send in a mouse for each child to use with their tablets. And yet this is not approved by Baltimore County Public Schools. It is being done quietly. What about those children who do not have parents advocating for them? At least one teacher requested money from DonorsChoose.org for a Title I school in BCPS, and the others are using a trackpad that does not work for their developing dexterity. This brings up another issue for those of us with concerns about system-wide issues. 
The stakeholder survey had no space to write any comments or constructive suggestions. There were very few questions regarding the overall policies of Baltimore County Public Schools. For example, there was no space to write that I, as a stakeholder and parent of two children who will attend Baltimore County Public Schools, want more educators and less computers. Please offer us the opportunity for real stakeholder input. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. Good evening. As we conclude Black History Month, I would like to give honor to my ancestors and African Americans who've made, who have made and continue to make history standing up for equality. Also, I would like to honor women all over the world, both past and present, as we begin celebrating Women Histories Month today. Therefore, my speech tonight focuses on the historical trends in America that have impacted some, leader, some leaders' perceptions of black people and women in education. When growing up, I remember during Black History Month, it seemed like we learned about the same black people and events every year as if black people didn't have centuries of achievements before they were enslaved in America. So most Americans grew up seeing images of my ancestors as slaves, as people without power in their textbooks, or even witnessed some of their parents complaining about black children in their schools. Therefore, let's begin to discuss how American culture has influenced a biased mentality regarding black people or even women's capacity to successfully lead in the classroom or in the business world. For example, I can personally relate to the story of Ruby Bridges, a six-year-old black girl who was mistreated when she was given a chance to attend an all-white school in the 1960s. Have you seen the videos of what the adults were saying and doing to an innocent child? Furthermore, parents took their children out of Ruby's new school, alienating her because she was given an equal chance for a quality education. However, I wish I could say in 2016, teachers or leaders do not mistreat black children, but I can't. Therefore, I will continue to speak this truth so that this school system or any other school system would not intentionally discriminate against an innocent child because of his or her race, religion, affiliations, or zip code. So the first step the school system and its employees should take in order to become champions in education is to admit publicly when you're wrong and be, uh, become accountable for your unfair decisions. We know you're not perfect and decision making can be political. However, the political games need to stop because it's legally costly. Also, one legal case regarding discrimination is one case too many for a school system, focusing on equity for all teachers and students. In closing, as a leader, I chose to play this political game, and sometimes I did not enjoy playing it. But if it was going to change the politics that I see with people's lives and careers at stake, then I'm willing to step up to the plate for everyone, because as community members, we all have the right to feel safe, supported, and empowered. Therefore, I urge you to respect and protect an important gift from God who creates and nurtures the lives of your students, women, all women, who are sacrificial leaders, often feeling unappreciated and unaccounted for regarding the contributions they've made for centuries to societies throughout their years as teachers, as mothers, sisters, and wives. Ms. Moore, could I ask you to conclude your comments at this time? Yes, sir. With that said, I encourage every woman who has faced adversity in life to continue to acknowledge the winner inside of you and to show up more beautiful, more bold, and more brilliant than you did after you thought you have lost yourself in this political game. So rise up, my sisters. Stand tall, my sisters, and speak boldly, my sisters. We cannot move forward in this world without your teamwork. Happy Women's History Month. Compete, well, hashtag, compete with purpose. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Thompson.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Greetings to Dr. Dance and the board. I come to you on behalf of uh, Mr. James Goff, and I wish uh, I wish I could come to you as a Miffa Mill alumnus, but I can't. I wish I could say that I've known Mr. Goff for 20 plus years, but I can't. I wish I could come to you on be as a student of his, but I can't. But I can't come to you as a parent, a concerned mother, and the voice of my daughter, whom I saw go from zero to 100 and back to zero after what she misunderstood or didn't understand as what was happening to Mr. Garth. I was reluctant to put her in band at first, so I decided to listen to what the program was about. We as parents from the first meeting knew and from the first meeting, knew how the program was ran from funds to trips, to field trips. We was instructed the import. We was instructed and told the importance of making sure that our child was prepared, even at the point of making lunches for the New York trip, because we knew that the trip that the trip uh, would lead into the performance. I'm sorry, let me start up. Let me do that again. We was instructed the importance of making sure that our child was prepared, even to the point of making lunches for one trip, and was informed that the North Carolina trip was a long trip that would lead into the performance. He instructed us to make sure that our ch children ate a healthy breakfast, even uh, to the point of sending snacks. We were informed the space and time of the New York parade, reminding us that dinner would be served after the parade to get ahead of traffic. This is the trip we made lunches for. We were informed of where that was going and when they would return. We were also met about the uh, new uniforms for the band and for the dance team, show, uh, showing us the temporary uniforms for the dancers. Um, even not, it wasn't to everyone's liking, but they were to be uniform, not runway models. Now, what bothers me the most is the day that Mr. Golf left. My daughter came home and said he was escorted out in front of the students. Me, as a parent, thinking to myself, for real, no tech. For God's sakes, these are our children. So they attempted to protest. They decided not to play. They was threatened to get a zero. So they decided to protest on the street. Bring back golf. Bring back golf, they chatted. One day when I picked her up, I saw them coming across the street and they all got into a huddle. And I s stepped out of the car and I said, what's going on? They all looked up at me and said that they thought I was a cop. And they was told that if they protest on the grounds of the school that they would be arrested. I said, but you're coming from across the street. They said they didn't want their faces to be seen because they were afraid that they would be arrested or that they would get in trouble with the school. I told them not to worry about that. I also let them know that this is a man of 20 years in music. He's not only a man, he's a teacher, he's a mentor, he's a counselor, he's a father to the young men that don't have a father, provider to the less fortunate, part of the village that raises our children. And I want to know, a show of hands, how many on the board that's been to a competition, how many uh, are parents, complaining parents or critical alumnus has been to a parade or to a game or just stopped by Washington Avenue? Ever do to hear him play. I'm just asking to consider the fate of this man, the legacy of this band, the future of the band experience, the epic madness of these children, the joy of Miffa Mill Academy. Don't allow your decisions to be fueled by cultural technicalities. Don't be what you as leaders, we as parents, teach our children not to be. Power, struggle, bullies. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Wilson. <coughs> Good evening, board members. I'm here today to talk about the redistricting in the southwest area. You were presented with a proposed map for redistricting at your last meeting. I'm here today to ask you to reject the map and return it to the committee to develop a plan that meets its intended goal of reducing overcrowding. The committee had the ability to make significant change by redistricting a large cohort of students from Hillcrest Elementary to Catonsville Elementary. However, the committee chose not to. 
The plan as it has been presented does not reduce overcrowding and unnecessarily separates us from our neighborhood. I previously sent you a petition with 66 signatures of community members of Planning Block 351. This petition asks the board to ensure that the final map keeps Hillcrest Elementary School's enrollment below 100% and sends a group of contiguous planning blocks together to Catonsville Elementary School. Today, you receive the 10-year enrollment projections. If you look at the projections for Catonsville Elementary, the enrollment is projected to decrease in the next 10 years. When you take into account the 10-year enrollment projections and the number of students that will be redistricted with the proposed map, Canesville Elementary School will be at a 64% utilization rate in 2025, and Hillcrest Elementary will be at a 112 utilization rate. In addition to the proposed redistricting map, the proposal requests that Hillcrest Elementary have its boundaries reviewed in approximately three to five years. There are also plans for Hillcrest to request funding for an addition or renovation to alleviate the overcrowding that will remain after the proposed redistricting map is approved. Are you aware that Hillcrest Elementary School currently has five relocatable classrooms to support the overcrowding at the school? Can you imagine the costs associated with continuing to use these classrooms? Are you aware that there is a new development that is being built in the Hillcrest Elementary School District that will include 45 new homes with four and five bedroom houses? Can you imagine how many more students are actually not accounted for with these new homes? There are seats available at Catonsville Elementary and more Hillcrest students should fill them. Return the map to the committee for a plan that addresses the goal of reducing overcrowding and one that maintains our neighborhood as it has done for other neighborhoods. You notice what I did not say is please alter the map or keep us at our school. I said return it to the committee and ask them to complete the tasks they were assigned to and develop a map that does meet a map that does meet the guiding principles. As a pleasurable as this experience has been, I would not like to do it again in three to five years. Be responsible and spend Baltimore County taxpayer dollars the right way. Do not be fiscally irresponsible and rubber stamp a plan that does not work or will result in future renovation, construction, continued use of relocatable classrooms, and redistricting when it does not need to. I heard the families of the Lansdowne community and their support for a new school. I hardly think that the Southwest area deserves to take money out of that project or other deserving projects in the region to fund the redistricting again in the Southwest area in the next three to five years as the recommended plan requests. As stewards of public resources, I ask that you reject the plan and return it to the committee and I ask that you not approve it at the expense of my child. The least you can do for our community is to expand the current grandfathering policy to allow the 14 children of Planning Black 351 that will be the only ones redistricted to Catonsville at Hillcrest with everyone else that is apparently more Hillcrest than we are. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> our next speaker is Russell Kuhn. Hello, board. Good evening. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I do want to apologize. I wasn't trying to stuff the ballot earlier. Uh, it was an honest mistake. I uh, signed uh, the wrong side, and then I realized you guys wanted information for whatever nefarious reason you wanted. But <laughs> I, uh, I ended up putting two ballots in. Anyway, um, I had a number of things I just wanted to discuss today. My name is Russell Kuhn. I have five children. I live in Towson. I currently have one in Towson High School, one in Dumbarton Middle School, and two at West Towson Elementary School. Um, I'm not here to talk about the lack of air conditioning in Dumbarton. Um, I, you know, there's been plenty of that discussion. You're probably tired of hearing about it by now. What I wanted to focus about um, regarding Dumbarton was uh, the curriculum and the way that sixth grade math is taught. I've already had two children that are um, highly motivated and very good math students go through sixth grade math. Um, and they both struggled. And the reason they struggled was because the way that math was being taught was they were being handed a book, they were told, go home, take notes, and then we will discuss and go over things tomorrow, right? There was no proactive, it's, it was a, a huge switch. You know, on top of going from elementary school into a middle school, which is a huge adjustment, they had this massive change in, in instruction, which I, I still don't understand. Uh, I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. I'm gonna start, um, 
I, I'm aware that people complain about it, and this is going back a number of years. It seems to still be the practice. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it's handled across the county. I only have um, Dumbarton to, uh, to, to think about there. Um, so I would, I would suggest that perhaps you ask some questions to see what the case is. I have kids in, that have gone through 7th, 8th, and ninth, and, and uh, that math was taught uh, the way it was handled uh, previously. Uh, moving on, uh, just wanted to mention um, about BCPS stat. I know there has been a lot of discussion. There's a significant cost associated with that. I'm concerned about the privacy associated with all of the data that um, Baltimore County Schools is, you know, collecting on students, and even more concerned about any third parties that have access to that data. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the privacy um, policy is for uh, Baltimore County Public Schools, but I suggest that we take a long, hard look at that. I know that, in essence, um, you know, this is a new um, endeavor and that um, there's a number of technology companies involved and they're trying to prove ways to increase and, and make um, teaching more efficient, which can be challenging. So I suggest we look at that. The last thing I'll mention, because I'm running low on time, is the fact that um, the borrowing cost of money is significantly low historically. I have heard multiple people uh, talk about uh, facilities that are degraded, that need to be upgraded and replaced. And I would suggest to the board members, uh, within your capacity, if there's a way to approach uh, county and state uh, officials um, to borrow money at this low rate, uh, you know, it's like taking a, a mortgage when you get a super low rate, it's a great deal. You can buy more house with the money. You can buy more schools with the money. Uh, you're going to be forced to replace that uh, school stock at some point in time, and now's a good time. So that's Thank all. You. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jacob Daniele. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Jacob Daniele. I'm the parent of a son at Summit Park Elementary School. Tonight I come to before you with both a short-term and a long-term request to help ease the overcrowding that continues to plague our school. As the administration and Board of Education are well aware, Summit Park is significantly over capacity and our school population is projected to increase again next year. Our entire fourth and fifth grade classes are already housed in learning cottages that have been installed behind the main school building and students must walk back and forth between the trailers and school throughout rain, ice, and snow to access restrooms and the building itself. Our facilities are already too small to hold school-wide functions. As a result, we must hold separate assemblies for all our primary and secondary grades. Last year, we were even forced to cancel our third grade recorder concert, which is usually held on the same night as our fifth grade spring concert because of capacity concerns. Um, as a side note, uh, the Blueprint 2.0 plan uh, that calls for safety and security of our children is at risk at the school because the, the trailers are in the back. The access to the trailers is open to the community. There is no fence. There's cameras back there. but. The, the ability to access them is open to the community. In the short term, it is essential that we keep our class sizes small, particularly in our fourth and fifth grades. All of our ELA and STEM lessons for these two grades are conducted in the learning college cottages. Many of these trailers are very small with no storage and little room for movement. Because our current fourth grade has four classes and our fifth grade has only three, we will need an additional teacher in our secondary grades next year to ensure that our students have the proper space to think, to create, and to learn. In the long term, we need to keep working towards a permanent solution and we respectfully request that the Baltimore County School Board place us on a short term on the short-term capital improvement plan for the construction of an addition to our school and a renovation of the current space. We cannot continue to cram so many students into our small school building without negatively impacting their educational experience. We're already or already over capacity by about 135 students um, over the 336 uh, student capacity for the for the uh, for the, the school itself. Due to logistics, we do not have the space to add another learning college cottage. Besides, trailer-based learning is not the best environment for our students. We don't have enough parking. We don't have enough bathrooms. 
Simply put, we need additional permanent space. Summit Park is a proud blue ribbon school. Our students are thinkers and dreamers. They are creative and thoughtful, serious and silly. They are avid learners and we are and we commend Summit Park's teachers and administration for finding new and innovative ways to grow their young minds, even in the confines of our too small space. Please help us continue our tradition of excellence. Thank you once again for listening to our concern and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yara Sheikh. Good evening, President McDaniels and Superintendent Dance and the school board. Good evening. Good evening. I've been here longer than many of you. I have been, all of you actually, I have been advocating for seats in classrooms for a decade, trying to alleviate overcrowding and finding solutions for our aging infrastructure. Rogers Forge is happening all over again, a school that reached 180% capacity. We required a new school. Hampton Elementary's addition cost $19 million, and I say that because let's remember these costs of additions when we're planning and we're seeing these overcrowded seats hit our middle school and our high school. Remember, Ridgely is 100 ch children over capacity today. Next year, it's 200. And guess where they go to high school? Delaney. So imagine our disappointment at the scope of work that we saw this week. It doesn't address the overcrowding, and it doesn't address the site work that is going to be necessary in 2019 and moving on as we address over 50 buses, because we currently have about 47. Parking for the extra staff, parking for the extra juniors and seniors if they drive, parking for the extra administration that we're going to need. The construction of this scope of work finishes September of 2019. Guess when we're over 2,000 students? September 2019. We know what an addition costs when we look at what Hereford got and what we look at what Hampton got. And when we add that with the cost of site work and a $45 million projected scope of work now, it equals to be responsible to our taxpayer and responsible to our entire community, a new school. A new school is necessary when buildings get to 60 years old, and that's their life expectancy. When you're looking at telling a community you've advocated for years for this renovation because of a neglected atmosphere, and now you're telling us we're gonna to have to go back September of 2019 when we're overcrowded and go back and find the money for an addition or go back and find the money for site work. Now I understand better than anyone, you can't raise the money, but understand that this community is going after it and we're going after replacement schools when they're needed. When schools get to 60 years old, it's new schools, not renovations. Thank you. Thank you. At seven cents on the tax rate, you can build all the Our next speaker is Teresa Johnson. Good evening, board members, Good evening. Dr. Dance, Superintendent McDaniels. Recently, I was made aware of a relationship between a school board member and a Milford Mill alumni, at the alumnus being informed of privileged information concerning the allegations against Mr. James Goff, Sr., Milford Mill's band director. It was also brought to my attention that the alumnus told said information 
to some of her friends, even before Mr. Goff was made aware of the allegations. I find this information both disturbing and reprehensible. Um, especially given the fact that as band parents, we have been informed that it's a personnel matter and I choose not to release the names of the parties at this time because they know who they are and I just want them to know that it is known. As a parent of two students at Milford Mill Academy High School, one being a senior and the other one being a sophomore, I am disheartened at the lack of communication that was, that was not given to us, the lack of follow-up regarding this situation about Mr. Goff, my daughter, who is a senior, is going to miss out on the many great opportunities Mr. Goff has often allowed or enabled students to have, such as music scholarships. My daughter will get none of that, none of the recognition that she worked so hard to be recognized for. No trophies, no music scholarships at different colleges, nothing. And I'm very upset about that. I understand that you guys did put in place someone who does have nice credentials, but it does not compare to Mr. Goff's credentials at all. His level of experience, the respect that he commands, I cannot sit here and explain to you what that means to me as a parent. The students who are in the band program now are not the same. My daughters are not the same. And I really want some information about when you guys are planning on bringing Mr. Goff back. When are we gonna get some follow-up about it? Because it's apparent, I don't appreciate it. We demand that he is restored to his position. In closing, we have a question to ask. If a teacher can ask for money on change.org, why is Mr. Goff being investigated for raising money for Milford Mills Band? He is an awesome teacher an awesome teacher. These kids are unprepared for their adjudications coming up and it's not fair to them at all. And I just ask that you consider it and put aside our egos and let's get these kids back to the level to where they were. And in closing, what you are receiving is a petition that uh, more than 600 parents have signed. That is a, that is a petition for 500 parents on change.org whose website is over 600. Okay, and I just want to let you know that. And the picture that you see are the children being at, they were at the um, Buffalo Bills pregame show. One of the many different experiences that they've had at Milford Mill Academy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Beverly Grace. It's really not much more for me to say because she said it all. I'm here again as a concerned grandmother of a band student, um, and we want answers. We're tired of hearing things here, there, everywhere. Um, yes, my daughter has a friend who got privileged information and passed that on to me when all of this first started. I'm like, how did you get this information? And we don't even know anything about it. And it didn't come from, it, you know, um, we, need, we need Mr. Goff back. It's, the whole school is just in chaos, but mostly in the band room. The kids, they're not getting their adjudication next week. I really feel sorry for them. The seniors are missing out. Um, as I said when I was here last month, they don't have scholarship opportunities. Um, they, some of them, their parents, for whatever reason, they're not going to, they can't get them to Ohio. Some of them want to go to Ohio or North Carolina or South Carolina. They have to go audition, play their instruments, and they may not get there. Those are the kind of things Mr. Goff would do. He would take his time 
out to take the kids when their parents couldn't do it. He would take them to their auditions. A lot of them, they're not going to get that opportunity. When they go next week, you know, the kids are like, we sound a mess because they have a student teacher, a substitute, long-term substitute, who is, um, he's still a, t a, a student himself, and he's not really preparing them when they go to adjudication next week at the band festival. And they are top notch. They get, they get like A1, everything, all the time. Well, that's not gonna happen this year, and I really feel sorry, and I'm really upset about the whole, how everything was handled. I believe from the very beginning, because we don't know, but I just believe that things could have been handled in-house at Milford. Um, the rumors have been spreading around since day one. When he, when Mr. Golf was taken out in front of the students, something that should not have been done. And then social media, kids are putting this out. They heard this, they heard that. It's been a long time. This happened in October, this is now March. Things need to be resolved and resolved swiftly, speedily, get him back because the children are hurting. We're not being, we're hurting because our children are hurting. The seniors are the ones that are really hurting. They are the ones who are suffering. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our last speaker is Danette Zakari Mosh. Hi again, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here speaking to you again, and I guess it's no surprise what I'm gonna speak about, aid equality. I'm still the mother of a Westtown Elementary School student, my daughter and my son who goes to Catonsville Middle School. And um, I was at the Southwest Redistricting Committee. I saw you all there. Um, it's, a, it's also an issue that uh, affects our family. Um, and you know, I saw how much work goes into the process for you and how complicated it is. And um, it really, uh, it made me appreciate even more the, the work that you have to do, the enormous role that you play. There's so many stakeholders, so much cr criteria to weigh. And so I'm not here on such a complex issue, but on an issue that's really a no-brainer, right? Eat equality. Um, a no-brainer, something our community has been asking for for about a decade. We're not asking for a professional day that just happens to fall and eat. Our community um, has been consistent in asking for the whole pie. We want to enjoy the same privileges that our Jewish brothers and sisters enjoy on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We want a day off for our children on Eid. And since we were last here speaking about this issue, a couple of really exciting developments have happened in our neighboring community. Howard County has already instituted equality. So all of the Muslim children and other children um, celebrating their respective faiths will now have, I hope you know, Eid off next year. <clears throat> so our neighbor has accomplished this, and yet we are the largest Muslim community in Maryland. And we are asking for the same thing. We are larger, our numbers are bigger, and yet we're lagging behind our neighbor, Howard County. Another development, President Obama made a historic visit to a U.S. mosque. It was very exciting. He chose, of all the mosques he could have gone to, he chose uh, Baltimore County. And he chose the Islamic Society of Baltimore, which is in, uh, which is where a lot of the people that came and filled up these halls and filled up the, the room here a few meetings ago uh, are members of that mosque. Um, and he, he had a very important message um, for us. He reminded our nation that the, uh, <coughs> you know, Islam is not something new to America. And we've talked about that. You know, I've addressed that. 15 million slaves were brought over here in the Middle Passage. Uh, uh, many, many millions of them came with their faith, okay, Islam, and he, and he mentioned that in his speech. I think that's important for us to, to talk about here in this context. Uh, lastly, he told our children uh, a very important message, and I hope that you all will make the decision for eat equality because it resonates with this message. He said, you fit in here. You fit in here. And that was on the cover of the Baltimore Sun with all of our, our children from Baltimore County shaking his hand and, and pushing over each other to shake his hand, to hear that message. And I hope you will send that message to our children. I hope you will <coughs> not lag behind Howard County. It's time for eat equality. It's a no-brainer. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next agenda item is old business, the Southwest Area Elementary School Boundary Study, consideration of the Southwest Elementary School Boundary Recommendation. And at this time, I'd like to call forward uh, Ms. Heidi Miller and Mr. Matt Cropper. I don't know if he's coming forward or just a watch from the... Good evening, Ch Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. We are Heidi Miller and Dr. Monique Wheatley Phillip, co-chairs of the Southwest Boundary Committee. On February 2nd, 2016, the Board of Ed received for consideration and approval a report from the Southwest Area Boundary Committee recommending boundary changes to schools in the region to help relieve overcrowding. Mr. Matt, Matt Cropper, GIS consultant, presented the process and provided several options that the committee discussed and voted on. The recommendation known as option 3-2-B revised affects the boundaries of Arbutus, Catonsville, Halethorpe, Hillcrest, Relay, and Westchester Elementary Schools. <coughs> A public hearing on the recommended boundary change was held on February 17, 2016 at Catonsville High School. The recommendation, option 3.2B revised, is being forwarded for board approval at this time. Mr. Cropper, Dr. Brown, Dr. Wheatley, Phillip, and I are available for any questions. Uh, Ms. Eaton. Um, you just stated that the one of the main goals was to relieve overcrowding. Is 3.2B achieving that goal? Yes. <laughs> so um, Hillcrest will not be over 100%? Hill, Dr. Brown, would you like to address that? So with the new boundary, yes, Hillcrest will come in uh, at 100% and is projected to climb to be over 100% as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, and is uh, projected to climb over 100% as we move forward. And Catonsville is going to be at 82%? Correct. Catonsville will come in at 82%. So you really didn't achieve eliminating overcrowding at Hillcrest? Well, we achieved quite a lot of uh, relief for Hillcrest in the process. Um, it is moving 88 students out of, out of the building and would reduce uh, overcrowding substantially uh, if implemented as recommended in 3.2B revised. Okay, thank you. Mr. Collins. <coughs> now, we, <coughs> we heard from the uh, young lady, the parent, uh, she certainly was a young lady as well, but she's also the parent of the of children, and she talked about the 10-year uh, projection, and we did receive them. I didn't get a chance to look at it closely um, because I didn't uh, do my homework for this meeting until today. But um, I uh, heard her say that uh, in 10 years, Catonsville is estima um, estimated to be at 62 percent and Hillcrest at uh, something at 112, I believe she said. And uh, also there's another housing development going in there with, with large, um, large houses possibly producing more children. Uh, obviously we don't know, people move in, people move out of the existing houses as well. Um, so to, you know, to this, is, this isn't my first rodeo on, on, um, <laughs> on uh, school boundaries. And there's, there's always people who are, who are disappointed by the outcome, but um, that sounds, first of all, is that correct? And if it's correct, um, she is also correct that you gotta, you gotta do this over. So two points, uh, the first of which, and for those of you that were with us last year, you will recall we did this with Lyons Mills. Uh, you received a report for students count, and students count was produced based on the September 30th enrollment and was produced prior to the application of the new boundary because the boundary vote hadn't occurred yet. The student's count document that you have uh, currently doesn't take into account this proposed boundary because the boundary doesn't exist yet and it hasn't been voted on by the board. It would be presumptuous for us to project that forward assuming the, the vote. 
if you will recall from last year, we provided an update to students count that reflected the, the boundaries for Lyons Mills and a redistribution of those counts. So I appreciate the fact that folks are using students count and looking at it. We, we do a lot of work with that document. It isn't appropriate, however, to do the math the way it's been done in this case because it doesn't take into account the, the boundaries that are, are going to be implemented. Could you do the math appropriately? We have done the math appropriately for three years out and I also want to add a piece in terms of the projections because we did something different with the projections this year than we've ever done before. So historically projections are based on a cohort survival method and that's where you look backward at what's happened with the enrollment in your buildings over time and use that to carry forward to, to project what you would anticipate. But we've worked with the county this year and we wanted to start looking forward a little bit more instead of just basing it on a backward look, how can we maybe look forward? And actually one of the things we looked at was proposed housing and anticipated yields from proposed housing and that's incorporated in this year's students count and those projections. So we actually anticipate the, the impact of housing. Is there any realistic <clears throat> belief by the committee that Hillcrest isn't always going to be crowded or over at maximum or overcrowded and Catonsville is never going to get there. I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. Is there, is there any realistic belief by the committee that Hillcrest is not always going to be at 100% or over 100% and Catonsville is never going to approach 100%. They'll be fortunate to get to 85 uh, on a good year. Is that, is, is that an accurate uh, statement I'm making? So what I'll, I'll speak to, because I don't know that I want to necessarily speak to what all the committee members believe. Well, let's, how about you tell me what you believe? So based on the data that they work with, Okay. The committee members had the opportunity to, to see what we would anticipate in terms of enrollment. They would anticipate that Hillcrest, and this, this information is provided to the board and the community, that Hillcrest would come in at overcro being overcrowded. We do, however, also expect that uh, Catons would, would come in, Catonsville will come in under capacity. Yes, that is, is what's in the data and what's been presented to the board and the community. Yeah, and you just were saying, and I think it's a wonderful thing to do, to attempt to project outward. Right. And, and uh, obviously you, there's no confidence that you're accurate or going to be anywhere near accurate if you're talking about redoing it in three to five years. Um, you know, I mean, do we really know what we're doing is what I'm really asking you. I've, I've been singularly unimpressed with Mr. Cropper's work before and uh, on other school situations. And there's always a school that all the parents want to go to. It's frequently an old school. We ran into the same exact thing uh, when we had, we were opening May's Chapel, a wonderful school, going to be a lighthouse school, going to be, uh, have all the latest equipment, and, and, and parents at Riderwood had no interest in, at all in, in, in having their kids, and they were in here every two weeks for the entire year, telling us how wonderful Riderwood was, and, and, um, and that committee you know, screwed the whole thing up to the point where I did something I next to never do, and that was abstain because there was no way of knowing that they knew had any idea what they were doing. And I'm beginning to get the idea that this committee didn't either uh, have any idea, a uh, terribly good idea what they were doing. Um, I mean, I, I do not know the community. I did not get in my car and drive over and drive it. And I know these are very difficult tasks, okay? But, um, you know, but uh, did we, did we leave too many children going to Hillcrest and not enough children going to Catonsville? And, and, and I think that's obviously what happened. And, and, the, and, and the fatal flaw in the whole process is that when we do this, we don't look at the middle schools. And the parents are looking at the middle schools. And this is much more about who's going to go to Catonsville Middle and who's going to go to Arbutus. And, and, and uh, you know, we can do a much better job on this stuff than we did on this time and any of the time since I've been on the board. <clears throat> but, uh, but, you know, I mean, obviously, obviously, it's incredible to come in with a plan that's going to have some place knowingly over capacity all the time and another place knowingly significantly under capacity all the time. I mean, that's loopy. We have to be able to do a better job than that. Isn't that so? Is that's there a the question? Point, and that's the point I was trying. Isn't that so? Was the question? <laughs> so, to that, I, I will reply. Um, 
that having gone to all the committee meetings, I have a deep respect for the committee members and the work that they put in, into this. And the amount of time and effort and diligence with which they approach this work and how well they informed themselves in that process and what a challenge it was for them and the layers of things that they considered in this process. And I think it was a very complex um, decision that they made and it was made by the people who live in the area. And I agree with all those statements, Dr. Brown. I'm, I'm not criticizing anyone's hard work, but you know, we all know about special interests. We all know about how these things are done. And it was obviously dominated by the interests of those who wanted to stay at Hillcrest. That's a tribute to Hillcrest. Last year, not this school year, but last school year, when, they were, when there was the talk and, and, and in its wisdom, which I agreed with, the county came forward with, with, with a massive amount of money to build new schools in the Cadenceville area. And, and I'm delighted that we did that. Um, but the folks from Hillcrest came in uh, every two week period those who were on the board at the time will remember. Uh, and they told us how wonderful Hillcrest was and they, they wanted a new school. They didn't, they, they, you know, but they were very sure they wanted their children to stay there. And, and uh, you know, that same thing happened here, uh, just like what happened with Ryder Wood and what happens most of the time. I don't know if there's a better way to do it, but, but I do think that, that when we do this, we, we need to look at the at the uh, at, at the middle school issues because they're really the drivers of this uh, concern. I'm part of the parents I'm, in many cases, I believe, and and uh, we we didn't do that at this time. I don't think did we? Yes, we did. Um, we in fact, at the we did schools. look at the middle schools, and it's important to note that the elementary boundaries are actually done independently of the middle school boundaries. Yeah. And we are not actually changing any of the middle school boundaries. And part of the proposed boundary that is coming forward to you today actually aligns the boundary between Catonsville and Hillcrest to align with the middle school boundaries as they exist today. Well, now, answer, I'm, I'm re recalling a few conversations because I uh, called some of the folks who sent us emails. And it was a while ago. I'm, I'm trying to recall some conversations uh, on, the, on the issue of... Um, of do all of the children at Hillcrest go to Catonsville Middle? No, part of the, the children that go to uh, Hillcrest currently go to Arbutus. Okay, and, and, and how about the Catonsville elementary kids? Where do they go? Arbutus. They go to Arbutus. So, so um, uh, are, are the children who are being excluded, or, uh, that's the wrong word, who are being, um, um, moved or designated for Catonsville, are they children that would have been going to Arbutus anyhow? Yes, they are. And they're children that currently are on a bus and now will be able to walk to school. Well, I know that. But so, so, so I'm wrong then. It's not about the middle school. All of the, all of the uh, Arbutus kids who are going to be going to Catonsville because of this would have been going to Arbutus Middle even if they stayed at Hillcrest? Yes. Good, you're sure? Okay, I, I, I feel better about that. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, I didn't glean that. I'm not saying the parents didn't tell me correctly. Uh, I'm sure they did, I just didn't catch it when I talked with them on the telephone, so that, that, that's helpful. I feel better about that. Um, I still don't like the, what we did, uh, but I like it better. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Can I just follow up with that? Um, I have some other questions. But isn't planning block 485 going to, I, I can't read that number, but 481, it's staying at Hillcrest, but it's going to Arbutus? There are planning blocks that are in Hillcrest that are not being moved, where the students who live in those planning blocks have been going to Hillcrest and have been subsequently going on to Arbutus and they're not being moved. The one planning block 351 that is being moved which I think was the question was whether or not the planning block that was being moved, whether or not that was impacting the middle school feeder pattern for that group of students. It is not. Okay, but the, Senator Collins, you are correct in one respect that there is a planning block that is staying at Hillcrest where those children will go to Arbutus Middle. So there's not 100% alignment in the current, in the 33 to be 
plan. There's Correct. not a hundred percent alignment to Arbutus. There are some children that are in this plan that will stay at Hillcrest, but then have to move to Arbutus. But uh, Kathleen, I thought I thought that Dr. Brown said that uh, Arbutus anyway. The children, those children would have been going to Arbutus anyway. Yes, but ne but they're still staying at Hillcrest, so they're not going to Catonsville Elementary School with the other students. Right, right. But I'm, but I'm not I was saying there's the, anything wrong with that. No, I'm just trying not, to be clear with what yeah, parents told you. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I had a mis a misperception that that uh, that uh, children uh, that were being changed in elementary school that was going to affect the the the, the middle school that they would go to, but but that's not the case. Correct. Right, they're not changing any middle school yeah. alignment. So, so the kids is my understanding. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that I feel better about that. I still don't like like the numbers seem wacky, but but I feel a lot better about that. I thought that 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 was not considered as much as it ought to be, and um, so I feel a little better about that. Thank you, though. Ms. Williams, you have. I just have a question. If Hillcrest is still going to be overcrowded, why is it that there are, and, and I believe I'm correct, like five families that were excluded from being able to go to Hillcrest. Locust Drive. Right, on Locust Drive. So Locust Drive is part of Plan Block 351, and that actually encompasses a much larger group of students than, than just a couple families. Um, we're actually looking at, within that, um, what, we're, we're referring to the 400 block. So the, again, the 400 block is part of planning block 351, and making an exception for one part of that planning block would then, I think, raise questions for students in the remainder of that planning block. Why? Why? Mm -hmm. uh, well, again, I want to come back to the planning blocks were developed and then vetted by the community, and the community had an opportunity to change this, and this is actually one that they looked at quite a lot, and they chose not to change it. The planning block divides currently on the, the middle school boundary. So that portion of Locust Drive actually is in the Arbutus boundary and has been in the Arbutus boundary. The housing in that planning, that area, is actually spaced much close, more closely together than the housing further up. It's in a, it, currently the students in that portion of that uh, planning block are on a bus to go to school at Hillcrest. They will walk. If they go to why are we why are we still getting emails from from if the community voted on this why is the community not happy I'm confused um, this is I think the third one of these that I've gone through now and I don't know that I've ever seen the community uh, this quiet actually the last couple passes on this uh, have, have actually been a little bit uh, particularly when we think back to Mays Chapel, there was uh, a much more animated uh, conversation around this. I think that the community really worked hard on this. People don't want to leave their school. Okay, let me just ask you another question. Sure. Um, this new development, where there are only a few homes now or a few homes planned, but it's projected that there will be additional homes, they're being given, they're being given an opportunity to go to Hillcrest while the families in the 400 block of Locust aren't, and it seems to me that we're giving an opportunity to a, a group of children who aren't there yet versus a group of children who are in that area and want to go to Hillcrest. I'm, I don't understand that. So there were a variety of permutations that were offered to um, and actually developed by the community in response to feedback uh, <coughs> from the uh, community event, surveys, et cetera. Uh, ultimately, the, the committee voted on this solution. Um, every solution has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, the, the community in the southern part of that uh, area advocated fairly strongly that there was no way for the, uh, their students uh, to get to Catonsville without going through the Hillcrest Zone. It would require them being transported through Hillcrest in order to get to uh, the Catonsville building. Um, ultimately, again, the committee voted on this. 
So there's no way that um, with this particular proposal recommendation that um, the children uh, in the 400 block of Locust Drive can be um, included in the planning block 514. If they were moved into that planning block, it would subdivide planning block 351. It would um, not change their designation to go to Arbutus Middle, so they would go to Hillcrest and then subsequently to Arbutus Middle. It would then take them out of a walk zone for Catonsville and put them on a bus to go to Hillcrest. So, but if but if parents are okay with that, and it's only a small number, and if their concern is that their children won't be able to socialize with the children in their own in their community, why isn't that important to the decision in the redistricting? I'm not suggesting that it isn't. Um, again, the committee had a very difficult challenge in front of them where they had competing interests from a variety of stakeholders in the community who voiced themselves in a variety of different ways, and they tried to pick what they thought was the best way to resolve this and provide relief to the building. I don't think it was an easy task. I, I appreciate that, and I do respect the work of the committee, and, and I, I, I'm, I know how hard they worked, um, but I'm not happy. Yeah. I would just like to make a com comment to follow up on, on Ms. Williams' uh, question. Um, as you said, I think every plan that was presented has strengths and weaknesses, and one of the weaknesses that I perceive of the plan being presented, it doesn't eliminate overcrowding at Hillcrest or uh, Johnny, some of the other schools that were considered. That's one of the weaknesses. Um, but my general comment is that if we consider making further exceptions to put more people in Hillcrest by any chance, we're making a weak plan even worse. So in terms of the goal of minimizing overcrowding, um, it just really concerns me if we have a weak plan that addresses overcrowding and we're going to consider making further exceptions to that plan that would would uh, overcrowd Hillcrest even more. And that's what some of these exceptions seem to do. I hear what you're saying, but overcrowding is overcrowding. And it seems to me that the set goal of eliminating and reducing overcrowding really hasn't been accomplished. Thank you. And Mr. Yofelder? You know, the, the redistricting is difficult. And there are more criteria than just the overcrowding of schools. Um, and I wouldn't call this a weak plan because we don't know what a strong plan is because there is no one plan that solves all the problems for all the parents for the community. And we have faced this three or four times over the last eight years. And I, I, keep, I keep referring to uh, my, our wonderful Sun paper who several years ago made the comment that in redistricting, you will not satisfy 100% of the population. There are parents who are parochial about their school, their street, and you just can't do it. You try and take into consideration all the criteria uh, that I think 1280 has, and you try and come up with a plan that best suits whatever your, the community decides. And this was a community effort. The committee is a community effort. It's not our effort. And if, if we as board members are going to go back and start pulling all this data apart, then perhaps we shouldn't have any boundary committee. Maybe we ought to be the boundary committee and start out the day one and get all this data and, and make the decision based on data. But I don't think that we can say that, that the, the committee did a poor job. I don't think they created a weak plan. I think they did what they thought was the best for the community at large. And I have to respect their work. I am not a judge of how competent or incompetent they may have been and or how they analyzed the data but obviously they had the data to work with and they did it over a considerable period of time yeah. I, I correct me i didn't mean the plan was weak i was saying that one of the plan. weaknesses yeah, of the plan. Weak plan all right well i i do compliment the committee again and uh miss Causey and then mr collins um mr brown if you could just clarify for me please um in the committee process there were schools that were not impacted at all by uh, by the plan. They neither had students come to their schools nor students leave their schools, but yet they voted on the plan. 
So when we're talking about the community making the decision, there were, in fact, votes cast for this plan by committee members uh, that her, her schools were not impacted. So that, that's a fair statement. Actually, let me uh, clarify. <clears throat> we had uh, all 11 buildings involved in the process, and during the process, every one of the buildings had a proposed plan that would have adjusted their border at one point or another. So it was really critical that everybody be involved. When it came time to the vote, uh, the, the buildings that were involved in the vote um, and were affected by the plan were very well represented. So Hillcrest, Catonsville, and other buildings were very well represented. In fact, some of the buildings that uh, were not going to be impacted by the plan, Ed Heights, for example, and I recall that off the top of my head, didn't come and didn't vote. So many of them chose not to vote in an area where they, they knew they weren't going to be impacted. But we, we were, the board received email back in December from a community member talking about that. So as early as early December, it was known there were schools that were not going to be impacted, and yet there were school community members that were not impacted but that did vote. So, so and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong or right about that, but I'm just asking for clarification. So, again, two points. Um, yes, in December it looked like it was shaping up that some buildings might not be impacted. There were substantive changes to the, the plans after that point in time. We could not rule out that buildings were going to be impacted and there was actually quite a lot of advocacy, particularly around Johnny Cake, back and forth about whether or not there would be relief. So I think it would have been very premature to omit people from the process and not have, not have their voice represented early on. So I think the inclusion was incredibly important. Uh, in the vote, were there some people there who voted who uh, maybe didn't have uh, an impact in their community? Yes, I'd have to go back and review. I'm sure there were. I will say that I did notice that some of the buildings that were not going to be impacted were absent, however. Uh, building, and again, Ed Heights was the one that stands out to me. There was at least one other one um, that had no voting members that day. Okay, and then the other question I have is we, we did get, and thank you, um, staff, very much for preparing the, this chart for us that we had requested um, the Hillcrest Elementary School redistricting planning block analysis and enrollment projection impact. Um, my question is when we're talking and looking also at the student counts book, which is also very nicely done, um, on page 124 it talks about Hillcrest and the state rated capacity being 666. Um, is, does that include the relocatables, or is that without the relocatables? That's without. Okay. So uh, one of our uh, community members that commented was talking about uh, requests to have an addition at Hillcrest Elementary School, and maybe uh, Superintendent Dance, you could chime in. Um, is, is that a possibility, or is that really not a possibility since uh, Maryland State Department of Education uh, guidelines would suggest that 700 is the maximum for, for an elementary school? I think I would be confident in saying at this time there will not be another project that would impact those particular schools. I know in the future we may need to go back and look at that southern, I mean the northern part of the southwest area, but uh, I, would, I would go on record saying I do not believe there will be an addition put on to Hillcrest Elementary School. Thank you. Uh, so the, the numbers that are the adjusted numbers that show in 2018 Catonsville Elementary School being at 540, uh, Hillcrest at 680, Westchester 614, that that, that, that alignment um, is, is better than it is today for Hillcrest in terms of a, a lower overcrowding. So maybe it's overcrowded by 20 points if we move out to 2018. So my question about that number, it looks good. Does that include any um, additional homes being built in the development that Ms. Williams referenced, that where there's five homes currently, uh, but I think potentially 40 more to be built. I just want to understand what it, what's included in those numbers for 2018. So the, the 2018 numbers, which would be coming from Students Count, um, that, again, the Students Count methodology for this year, uh, the projections will include uh, anticipated housing build out. I would have to look to see exactly how many houses were considered or, or potential yield in that area. Okay, and so for, uh, and then to reference um, Senator Collins' question, for the Catonsville, the new Catonsville Elementary School, uh, 
and the number there is 540. That's based on uh, the housing stock that's currently available at the current rate of families moving into the area. You know, what is the relative difference in the number of homes or the number of occupancies? How do you look at that to make sure that that Catonsville Elementary School has the opportunity to increase capacity? So I, I think that that's a really good point to, to bring up because we've had a, a bit of a quandary in this area in terms of a change in how housing was used. Halethorpe in particular showed a, an explosion over time in terms of, of growth. And it was tied to uh, a Burmese population and a Hispanic population moving into the area and the housing being used with a, a very different yield factor. We're actually engaging in a yield study this year to be able to model that across the community as a whole so that we have a better way of, of capturing that. We know in our older communities, in, in areas where large numbers of, of the homes have been owned for long periods of time, that we expect rollover. And we can begin then to anticipate the impact of that rollover with the demographic shifts that come with it. So, so is it fair to say that with the new Catonsville Elementary School and the housing stock that is available, that it, the increase in students could be greater than the typical projection because people, families will be attracted to the new school. I, I'm, I'm just curious as to, for instance, Mays Chapel Elementary School and Lions Mill, what, ha, what, what have you seen? And we have, con and actually this is one of the things that we're very interested in trying to capture in the modeling as we move forward. There is a new school effect. We see it. When you build a new school, more people come than what you originally anticipated. So we've often, where we've had the luxury, and could open a new school and open it a little bit under capacity, we have chosen to do so, trying to anticipate that, that um, sort of blossoming of the population there. Okay, Mr. Thank Co you. Uh, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Thank Collins you. had a question. Or I, just had, I just have one quick comment or question. I'm not really sure which it is, um, <clears throat> but I, I can't let it go by. It is really troublesome that the Hillcrest parents and advocates for keeping as many kids at Hillcrest as possible suggested, well, we can go back and even got in the proposal, if I heard correctly, that we'll go back in three or five years and look at it again. Or we'll ask for an, or, uh, uh, an extension of the school, which they're not going to get, or an expansion of the school, which they're not going to get. Isn't that curious? Because all they were caring about, and I'm not criticizing this either, but it's objectively the truth. They were just caring about their kids because their kids are going to be out of there in three or five years. They don't give a damn what happens to Hillcrest then. So, I mean, <laughs> the committee didn't do a good it. job, is the simple truth. Uh, you know, I mean, I think I'm going to hold my nose with both hands and vote for this. <laughs> but, you know, it strains credulity for any of you to be sitting there and, or, and standing there and telling us this is, this is well done. Because I don't care how many meetings they had, they were all self-interested in preserving as many of their kids at Hillcrest as they could. And, and uh, that's what happened in this whole process. And it's not new. We saw the same thing with Ryder Wood uh, and, 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 the, and the battle to where they shafted Pot, Pot Springs because the Ryder Wood parents were noisier and more, more, uh, and more uh, numerous and going and diligent in going to the meetings. <clears throat> you know, we need to come up with a better system because to come before us with a plan that is going to have one school overcrowded and say, well, we look at it in three or five, five years again. And, you know, that's really, that's, that's shabby work. Isn't that so? It doesn't require uh, an answer, by the way. All right. Any, uh, uh, Mr. Stewart, did you have a question yeah. or comment? Uh, a few comments, okay. if you don't mind. Sure. And, um, a few things to say about the process altogether, and maybe this can be my time. I won't offer any remarks later. But I'll, I'll say this to, to Mr. Collins, that you know, Hillcrest really isn't the only school that is going to have growth issues, and Johnny Cake remains a challenge for this area. The community made a decision not to traverse a major, uh, a major road, which is Route 40, to try to find relief because it breaks up their community too much. And they made that decision that they want to stay at an overcrowded um, place acknowledging at the same time that their teacher to student ratio because of the resources because of modulars and so forth still remains acceptable to them and so you know this is kind of a messy uh, process but I, I will just say it, it wasn't just Hillcrest this was a larger conversation about what it should look like 
And that's to say, too, that this might not be completely the end of a conversation about growth in the area. Growth is happening for a lot of reasons, you know, largely a high quality of life, and it's, it's a good thing. So, you know, we're going to probably have to continue to talk about how to accommodate growth to protect quality of life going forward, and I don't think that that conversation stops here, in other words. Um, but I'll say also a few things that we'd like to keep in mind, I think, as we consider and as the public considers a recommendation. You know, the first thing is that we have this because we have an unprecedented $100 million worth of investment in this area, which is trying to account for that growth. So although there are some serious and substantial hardships here, the reason for all of this happening is, at bottom, a good thing. Um, second is that it is a community-driven process. It has all the pros and cons that are associated with that, rather than a directive by fiat uh, as to what we know or think is best for them. Um, we know that members of the local boundary committee spent many hours discussing this issue, developing the recommendation that started back in August 2015. Um, and I, I, for one, at least respect their efforts and their time that they gave to this. Not to say that there couldn't be improvements along the way, and you know, I think you and I have talked in the past about how we think we can make some changes. Um, I also respect the hundreds of hours of, you know, the parents who spent the time writing to us, the hundreds of emails that we received, the phone calls, in-person conversations. I think they're valuable to the process, and they were valuable to me at least. Um, and it's because of all of those reasons and the hours of research that I spent that I'm going to support the committee's recommendation. Um, but I'll say two things in, in saying that. The first is that we as a county have to do a fantastic job at what a transition should be and should look like. Um, from you know, individual attention for students to open houses to in-person meetings, uh, the whole nine yards, as we've done before, and I think we have uh, ways we can do it um, pretty well here. Second, to the extent that there are particular concerns uh, for particular students, you know, let's say that um, there's an individualized need um, or concern that there still is a special permission transfer process, and that's one that I'm going to work closely with uh, with staff members to make sure that everything is is fully considered and vetted on those issues. And the final thing I'll say to the community too is that uh, I am and remain always willing to to talk in person on the phone. You have my cell phone, most of you. Um, you know, this is this has been a, a back and forth, a conversation and dialogue, and it, it needs to remain one. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Ms. Causey? Um, referencing uh, back to Johnny Cake Elementary School, um, I was at one of the community meetings, um, which I was glad to be at with Nick, and I, I will take this opportunity to say that um, fellow board member Nick Stewart has really spent a tremendous amount of time, has had conversations with many, many, many of us. Um, and uh, is really heartfelt in his intention to try and do the best thing for the community. Um, I, it, for Johnny Kate, going back to that elementary school and our um, student counts, it says that the state rated capacity is 559. Is that correct? And that's without uh, accounting for the relocatables that are that are currently on their campus. Okay, so so that school might have a potential to have an addition in terms of something that would gain 150 seats or 175 seats? So I definitely don't want to speak today about a potential addition at Johnny Cake. We know that if you look at the northern part of the southwest area where Johnny Cake, Chadwick, Dogwood is, there's some development that's happening in that area where we're going to have to look at a capital project over the next couple of years in that area. Okay, thank you. Ms. Williams. Yeah, I just have um, one last question. So if I'm understanding this correctly, um, if this recommendation is approved by the board, uh, special permission exceptions are still possible um, on a case-by-case -case need basis. That would not be ruled out completely. It, once the board approves whatever plan it decides to approve, all kids in the fourth and fifth grade year will be given the option to stay at their current school. So that's the special mission transfer part that you're referring to. That also extends to their siblings who are enrolled in the school. Very well, so let, me, go ahead, let, let me clarify. So to the extent that, let's say, a second grader has an individualized need or a reason to remain at their school uh, with their cohort or with a particular um, teacher or so forth, assistant, uh, would that be something to consider uh, as far as a special request transfer goes? Of course, we look at every case on a 
case by case basis and there's an appeals process if a parent does not agree with whatever decision at whatever level but in redistricting cases it's only the fourth and fifth grade students and I remind the board that um, in prior years it was only the terminal grade level we changed I want to say three years ago um, to allow for fourth and fifth grade students and their siblings but keep in mind any special permission transfer that we grant for uh, Hillcrest particularly then raises that enrollment that we just were talking about in terms of the relief you want for that school. Romain, the distinction that I've drawn with respect to that issue is that with fourth and fifth graders, with siblings, that special permission transfer process is relatively uh, codified, so it's r relatively automatic, whereas with this kind of case by case, there need to be much more attention per the case. Right, and I just wanted to make sure that that is not being precluded or eliminated right. correct and I, I understand it would be a case-by-case case basis but I just want I, I, I want to be able to support this uh, recommendation because I know that the committee worked very hard very diligently and I know that you are the, the the experts in that regard but at the same time you know I've read all of the various emails and I am you know very sympathetic and appreciative of the comments that we've received from the parents and I want to make sure that I am doing the right thing on behalf of the parents and, and the kids based on you know my reading of their their emails and their requests so to Ms. Williams point it is codified in writing for fourth and fifth grade students and their siblings Thank you. Romaine don't hold your breath for any special permission transfers other than the, other than uh, what the superintendent just said because they're not going to happen Miss mm -hmm. Eaton if a parent they want to get a special request how do they go about that right. what's the procedure yeah it's laid out in our rule around what's the number Michelle 12 a 5140 um, it's laid out particularly in that one but there's a process where you start with the home school and so forth and then of course the appeals process goes up um, but again fourth and fifth grade is what's and to mr. Collins point that's guaranteed fourth and fifth grade and their siblings thank you miss quasi I have one more question um, related to what uh, we talked about earlier about the new school effect with families, is it possible for for uh, families that were districted to stay at Hillcrest or another school, if they wanted to send their kids to Catonsville, the new Catonsville Elementary School, um, can they move that way? Can they get a special permission special transfer? Special oh. permission transfers can happen in that direction as well. well yes. Okay. Would that be like more that. likely yes. in terms of um, since they're under capacity in terms of accepting families? Um, so within 5140, uh, if you read through it, it, it gives the, the criteria, and one of them has to do with overcrowding. Because what I, I just want to Kathleen. They'd be thrilled, They'd be thrilled Kathleen. Kathleen. Well, I just want to say, when I went to Lions Mill on the, the new tour day, and then we went back for the, the ribbon cutting, there was a lot of talk in the community, the, the parents that were there, and the teachers, uh, and the administrators, that there was hesitancy around being redistricted to that school, and yet the families said over the summer they did these events, and they were very glad to be there. And you know, when we, we went back in two months after school started for the ribbon cutting, I mean, it was really, really a wonderful environment for the for the students and the teachers, um, and it just really seemed a great opportunity. So I'm hopeful that even though, um, if it turns out that families are disheartened, that they can be encouraged when they start to really see. Catonsville Elementary School take shape. They have the uh, uh, fields outside nearby. Um, and when they see the faculty and staff that right now Catonsville Elementary School does very well, um, that they'll be encouraged that they are going to, as Nick said, be the benefactors of a wonderful investment that's happening in that area. All right. Any other questions or comments for the panel there? Uh, if not, um, do I have a uh, motion to approve the recommended Southwest area? Elementary school boundary option 3.2 B revised. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion at this time? Um, now, our student board member cannot vote in this case, so we'll need a majority of six. And I'm going to ask Ms. Decker to um, do the vote by roll call. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Stewart. Yes. Mr. Yolkov. Yes. Mr. Birch. Aye. Ms. Williams. 
Yes. Mr. McDaniels. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, thank you very much for your input. Our next agenda item is personnel matters. Item J, uh, call on Dr. Mayo. He's still here. He's still here. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice evening. Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, do I have a motion to approve uh, exhibits J1 through J5? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. <laughs> Dr. Dance. Yes, Chairman McDaniels and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointment, supervisor in the Office of Career and Technology Education. Do I have a motion for approval of the uh, administrative appointments? So moved. Second? Second. All, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I would like to uh, introduce our new supervisor for the Office of Career and Technology Education, currently right now the acting supervisor in that office, and that's Mr. Michael Grubbs. <laughs> Michael, thank you for joining us today. I see Doug uh, right next to you. you. did a phenomenal job with our business advisory this morning. Uh, do you have any family and friends here with you besides Mr. Handy? <laughs> 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 Congratulations, Mike. We appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Our next item is new business action taken in closed session. I call for Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the um, Board of Education considered an appeal regarding a confidential employee matter uh, in its quasi judicial capacity. This matter was considered on the record as there was no request for oral argument made by either of the parties. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action taken in closed session in that matter, which was your hearing examiner number 15-54. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve action taken in closed session? So moved. have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nussbaum. you, and the order sitting on the desk for signature. All right. Thank you. Our next. Okay. Our next item is contract awards. At this time, I'll turn it over to our chair, Mr. Gillis. Thank you very much. Uh, the building and contracts committee met earlier today. Although we didn't take a formal vote, I'll ask the committee members now, if I may, represent to the rest of the board that we recommend the approval of all those contracts. Yes. Very good. Uh, so. Um, uh, on behalf of the Building and Contracts Committee, I um, move uh, items M1 through M12. All right, do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M12? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we don't need a second, I'm right. sorry. All right, uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. That was easy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Dixit, do you have any update for the board today on any projects going on? I don't have an update, but in the next item, I have a request from the board to approve a new site. Okay. All right. Well, I... Mr. I did have a question for Mr. Saris, if I might just ask him. Um, it follows on the heels of a matter of uh, board action in an earlier meeting. Go, yes, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Sarah, you and I had an opportunity to speak earlier today. It was a follow-up with regard to uh, the board uh, action whereby the board chose not to approve a $41 million projector contract. Um, I asked you uh, what, if anything, was the status on that given the board's directive at the time of the, uh, the motion to uh, reject the, the, the contract. Uh, what, if any, update can you share with the board today uh, regarding that uh, projector uh, the possibility of a, of a new projector bid. Yes, we are uh, revising the scope of work and specifications. 
Um, we, it is our intent to present a contract to the board uh, in this fiscal year. Uh, we have uh, no more contract committee meetings in March, and we have one meeting in April. So our goal will be uh, to get this to the board in May or June so that we can uh, follow up as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, kindergarten teacher who was, uh, uh, had, who was very anxious about what might happen uh, asked that I follow up on that. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Um, Ms. Kwasi. Just if we can make a note, um, Mr. Gillis is out of the room, who's the chair of the board, uh, the contracts and building committee, but perhaps we could have a special meeting to help facilitate that. So if we could just make a note. Uh, what I can do is um, look at all the timelines for advertising and um, pre-bid meetings and so forth, and I don't think that it's possible to do it before May, but I'm happy to let you know if we think that we're going to be running into calendar issues. Okay. I just want you to know the board is willing to be helpful in okay. moving that along. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, as Mr. Dixit said, our next agenda item is uh, approval of the initiation of the design and construction for a new elementary school. So I'll turn it back Thank over you to Thank you and good evening. Uh, as you know, uh, as a community and school planning region, Northeast Baltimore County has experienced substantial demographic change over the past decade and growth is projected to continue. In October, the board approved the state capital improvement program and then again on January 5th, 2016, the board approved the county capital program. Both programs included a request for planning new elementary school. The site, there, there were three sites in the northeast side. Two of, the, two of them were owned by Baltimore County. The site that is most appropriate for this school is site owned by the Baltimore County. The purpose of coming here today is for you to request initiation of design on that site for the school at Northeast area. Uh, as part of the process, once the site is approved for design right now, we are going to go to IAC to get their approval, and we'll also proceed with converting with transfer of the uh, site to the Baltimore County Public Schools. And eventually then we'll come back at the end of the process for you to approve the acceptance of the, pro to the acceptance of the site. So today's request is for you to approve initiating the design on that site. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll make a mo ask for a motion and then we can have some discussion. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the initiation of the design and construction for a new elementary school in the Northeast? Uh, I move it. Do I have a second? Second. second. Now, is there any discussion about the planning, Ms. Causey? Um, I just have some questions. Uh, it was a, uh, talked about earlier that there were not community input uh, meetings around this particular location. Could you uh, fill us in on what are the adjacent schools and what are, what are the state of their overcrowding? Was that e pre ever presented along uh, with this site? It, w it was not along with this, but board did receive enrollment projections and board is aware, aware of the capacity utilization of all the schools. We can get that number to you again. Well, just in terms of the schools that are adjacent to this, in order for us to understand that it is going to be yeah. the right location for the overcrowding that's in that area. I'll ask Mr. Dr. Brown to speak to it for a moment. So uh, as part of the process, one of the things we have to do to justify state funding is to actually demonstrate that the number of seats that we're going to build would be justified by the neighboring schools. Um, Uh, specifically, in this case, uh, it's Gunpowder, Perry Hall, and Chapel Hill uh, are the three that are immediately impacted and likely through a domino of Vincent Farms. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Ms. Virch? Yeah, and um, you, members of the board, may recall uh, the superintendent's remarks 
um, in the fall, and you might recall a, a, co a, a re colloquy between Mr. Saris, uh, the superintendent, and myself with regard when to when the results of the uh, uh, enrollment projection study for the Northeast would be done, and who was exactly doing it, and it was being done by county government because they w they wanted to, if you will, fact check, verify, uh, backstop. Uh, some of the research that had been done by uh, our uh, BCPS staff, and um, we were trying to determine when the uh, uh, the autumnal equinox uh, would occur, because the superintendent said it, we would have the information by the end of the year, uh, before before the winter. And either way, it all worked out uh, as to uh, one study was completed, and uh, the superintendent, to his credit. And as you know, at times I have been critical of the superintendent. Um, the superintendent, to his credit, has said uh, that even with a 700-seat addition in this northeast area, there will still be a need to search for additional seats to alleviate overcrowding in the northeast. And uh, one need only go to um, uh, uh, Chapel Hill Elementary School to see a significant uh, degree of overcrowding. And when you uh, look uh, from above at available sites um, in the area, not that I've flown over recently, but uh, when you look at it, there aren't a whole lot, there isn't a whole lot of available property in uh, this regard. County government owning um, uh, land uh, made it uh, a valid site for consideration. And to the extent we're able to make a dent in the overcrowding in the Northeast, but not fully eliminate or completely address uh, is not to be taken lightly. And as, um, as someone whose district has uh, Victor Villa Elementary School in it right now, which is an overcrowded school and which uh, received news recently that there will be a new Victor Villa built, um, that will be a 700-seat school and that will go a great way to address the overcrowding in that uh, neighborhood and part of the county. And this school would go a long way to doing that as well. So that's just to refresh some of the committee members' recollection, uh, but uh, the superintendent has been very upfront uh, with um, what effect the 700-seat uh, school would have in the area, and uh, not that it would uh, be a panacea by any means. There's still a lot more work for uh, this board and our system and county government, which uh, writes the check, and state government, which also uh, pays a hefty sum to do to address overcrowding there. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Um, there are no other questions. We've, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I would ask all in favor to please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries then. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for Thank you. Thank your presentation. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Miller. Um, I have a motion under new business that I'd like to offer. Uh, is it an agenda item? Uh, it's under new business, yes. I move that the board establish a four-member standing committee called Safety in Technology. The purpose of the committee shall be to protect students in technology use regarding issues including cyber safety, student data and privacy protection, ergonomics, health concerns, emotional social consequences, brain and fine motor development issues, and assault due to student possession of devices. I second well, it. Well, again, this, this was not an agenda item, and we usually would give the uh, members some uh, time to consider your, your motion. So I would ask that we would... Time to uh, consider it right now. I, I'm making it as a new business motion per Robert's, Robert's Rules of Order. Okay, um, it's been moved and second. Any discussion? I move we table this until we have more information as to uh, wh why we need this and whether we already have uh, safety uh, in the various areas that are referred to. Second. Okay. I yeah. haven't gotten a chance to even speak to my motion. We, we have gotten a motion to table this until another, and it's, again, I think it's a problematic because we don't have it on our agenda to discuss. Well, it, it's, it's on the agenda as in it's a, a motion under new business, which is in line with Robert's Rules of Order. All right. 
We have a motion now that, to table the discussion, and that, that's been second, so we have to vote on the current motion that's on the floor to table the motion. So, um, all in favor? We have, yeah. Sorry? Okay. So, all in favor of the motion to table the motion, uh, please raise your hand. So we have seven votes, so that motion carries. So we'll table this um, motion until we have time to um, discuss it and review it by the board. All right, our next agenda item is uh, our, our board co comments. Um, I think at this time we'll start over on the uh, right side with Mr. Virch. Um, last month, uh, our second board meeting was canceled because of the weather. Uh, that was the right decision. Um, but of course, it was also Black History Month. And uh, this is uh, Women's History Month. And I wanted to recognize an African-American teacher that I had because I believe history is about more than those whose names you always hear. Uh, because there are many people whose names you never hear who impact on so many lives. And when you think about the impact, it's in part uh, those things that we do every day. And um, teacher, it impacted on my life uh, because I never had Mike Collins as a teacher at Kenwood High School. But uh, Gladys Coleman was uh, a business teacher and she taught an important class. At the time it was called personal use typing. Today we refer to it loftily <laughs> as keyboarding. And uh, keyboarding is something that I use every day. And uh, Gladys, uh, Miss Coleman as we called her of course, uh, taught us to type with rock music playing so that we would learn to develop speed and uh, pace uh, with a minimum of three errors if you were able to get to 35 words a minute. Uh, and so I would recognize Gladys Coleman uh, for, for Women's History Month and the impact that she made on the lives of thousands of students uh, by teaching them this most valuable keyboarding skill. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Certainly. Ms. Miller? We have heard from a lot of members of the public, parents, teachers, about concerns regarding uh, technology use and uh, safety concerns. Uh, I want the public to know that at least some of us hear you. I think this is an issue that certainly is not going to go away. It's going to become more important as we go forward and get further into technology. Um, please make note of um, how the vote went just now, uh, and we will try again. We'll keep trying. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Ms. Johnson? I don't have a comment tonight. Thank you. Ms. Wallier, Mr. Gillis? I'd like to thank all those who participated in the Southwest redistricting process. I know it was a long one. I know a lot of community members, a lot of uh, parents and teachers and administrators participated. Um, and I just think everyone did a great job. I think the discussion the board had was also substantial. I want to uh, particularly note and thank Nick Stewart, who I think was a great uh, representative of the Southwest, and I think he did a great job. Thanks. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Mr. Yulfelder? No comments. Ms. Gauzy? Uh, good evening. I would just uh, like to, um, number one, dovetail with um, board member Ann Miller. We have gotten a tremendous amount of emails and we've had folks come here even tonight talking about issues with safety and technology. There's a lot of uh, issues out there, including liability with uh, webcams inappropriately taking pictures with, uh, with perhaps data collection that's going on that the parents are unaware of. Uh, there's also, as was mentioned uh, by Ms. Miller, health and safety factors. And despite the fact that we have had parents uh, coming and, and addressing these concerns, and despite the fact that we've seen numerous articles in the newspaper recently, the board has received no updates from the staff related to those concerns, which is one of the reasons why I believe and will continue to uh, advocate, as Ms. Miller has started here tonight, for having a standing committee, uh, that a board committee, uh, that will uh, analyze safety of the students and also the teachers in terms of their uh, increasing work related around technology. There are OSHA rules now for folks that work in offices related to how they interact with technology and we know that 
anyone that's heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, that there are things that happen in uh, interacting with technology that were not necessarily accounted for uh, in planning or Im implementation. So we do owe it to our students and our teachers and our parents to really review this and, uh, and get the latest research and also perhaps to uh, institute some uh, analysis of what's happening um, in the schools as we move forward with uh, including more technology. Um, I would also like to comment on the high schools uh, that are going through the uh, feasibility studies that just came out and the renovation process. Um, there are a number of concerns with the actual academic environment in trying to retrofit these 60-year-old schools, as was pointed out tonight and many, many other nights. We've heard from the Delaney community. We've also heard a tremendous amount from the Lansdowne community recently, including their uh, petition that is sent to the board every time they increase by 100 members, and I believe that petition is up to 1,200 members, um, where we need to carefully look at the taxpayer dollars and what will provide the most effective learning environment for our students, effective and safe. So I believe we need to give that further attention, um, and I will be working on that as I can. Um, also, I just want to say I enjoyed going to Lansdowne High School and um, at their PTA meeting and interacting with their uh, principal, students, and staff, um, wonderful folks that really do care about what's happening with their students. And I also was pleased to make it to the Delaney PTA meeting. Um, I will be uh, visiting schools later this week and hopefully to catch some of those Reading Week activities. Um, and I'm. Again, just uh, grateful to be here, and I'm just trying to do the best that I can for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Williams, do you have any? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm happy that I was able to attend the um, NAACP uh, meeting uh, that was held in the Northwest area, um, and personally talk with many of the parents who were concerned about um, Mr. Goff and the situation. Um, as a board member, we have been told that it's under investigation, but as it has been stated, it has been several months, and I would like for the board as quickly as possible to be updated um, on this situation. It certainly makes no sense if things are being leaked and even board members don't even know what's going on um, about this matter. The second thing that I want to say is um, PRC uh, is continuing to work on the heat policy situation. Uh, our agendas have been so full uh, that we have, in fact, scheduled a separate meeting to deal with the uh, heat policy matter uh, as we continue to see this as a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Eaton, you all right? I'm good. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stewart. Uh, real quickly, I'll, I'll just reiterate what um, Mr. Gillis was saying and thank the community uh, for a tremendous effort and a tremendous lift with respect to Southwest Redistricting and all the time and effort uh, that was involved in that process. And I also want to thank my fellow board members who really dug deep on the information and made a serious effort to, to try to do right by the community. And I just appreciate uh, the time you all took and look forward to working with you as we go through this process once again, maybe making adjustments along the way uh, based off of things learned uh, so that we can do it even better the next time. But the reality is, um, Tremendous effort, and I, I appreciate it. I know the community does too. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, moving on, there there are some items included in your information. Um, I'll just highlight the Southeast Area Advisory Council minute meeting minutes are included. Uh, update of key school legislation is included in board docs and communications. There's a financial report for the months ending December 2014 and 2015. Um, and the student count report also. Um, there's a half day system wide professional development day. Schools will be closed three hours early for elementary and middle schools on Friday, March 4th. And the next board meeting is Tuesday, March 15th, 2016. At 6 30. Oh, I'm sorry, we may change that. So um, uh, I believe it'll be 7 30. Uh, for the next meeting on March 15th. So thank you all, the meeting is now adjourned.